engage your brain and enter the mind's eye. Your one-stop shop for the politics to paranormal and everything in between. I'm your host, Brian Turnoff, and you're listening to Z Talk Radio. Part Indiana Jones, part Sherlock Holmes, historical detective Graham Phillips joins us tonight. He is the author of 13 books, including the fantastic The Templars and the Ark of the Covenant, Merlin and the Discovery of Avalon in the New World, and The Chalice of Magdalene. But on this May 19th episode, Graham joins us to discuss his latest book, The Lost Tomb of King Arthur, The Search for Camelot, and The Isle of Avalon. One of the more puzzling figures in history, King Arthur has been the subject of many fantastical tales over the past 1500 years, leading many scholars to regard him and his fabled city of Camelot simply as folklore and a myth. When we come back, you're going to hear evidence that King Arthur was a real man, Camelot a real place, and Grant Phillips has located them all. Find out where, in a matter of moments, when the mind's eye comes back. The International Space Station just had some trouble recently. It was recently hit by none other than space debris and caused a gash in one of the windows. If I was an astronaut, I would not feel too safe right now being with all that space debris floating around. More articles like this on the Mind's Eye social media pages. Check them out, Twitter, at Mind's Eye Show, and the same for Facebook, backslash Mind's Eye Show. Back with Graham Phillips on the lost tomb of King Arthur after this quick commercial break. This is the Mind's Eye. Let's give a big digital hand for historical investigator and author, Graham Phillips. Welcome to the Mind's Eye, Graham. Thank you very much for having me on, and uh, a great digital thank you to you. <laughs> it's a, it is our digital pleasure. Um, <laughs> when you wake up in the morning and you look in the mirror, do you see Indiana Jones or do you see Sherlock Holmes? <laughs> I have never been asked that question. Um, I kind of cross between the two, I suppose. There's a lot of deductive detective work goes into what I do, but there is a certain amount of charging around in the field, and I've been actually chased off land by farmers with shotguns, so uh, I've not bet yet had sort of people firing um, dart guns at me. What <laughs> way do you call those things? You blow talk. What do they call those things? That you oh, the blow blow, guns. <laughs> blow pipes or whatever. So... Yeah, yeah, I'll come back and cross between the both. Well, well, I'm glad to hear that you uh, made it and, and a couple of those uh, bullets have whizzed by you, and you're still here to talk about it. Um, and uh, on this edition, we're here to talk about your brand new book, The Lost Tomb of King Arthur, The Search for Camelot and the Isle of Avalon. Uh, there are uh, variations on the King Arthur legend, but set the scene for us. What's the generally accepted uh, legend or myth of King Arthur? Well, the story of King Arthur is that uh, he was brought up in secret because many people wanted him dead. And Merlin puts a sword in a stone that, with his magic, no one can pull this sword out of the stone unless they are the rightful king of England. Eventually, when he's 15 years old, Arthur comes along and just pulls the sword out with ease. And at that moment, he is proclaimed King of England. He then goes on to found the Knights of the Round Table, which are the greatest warriors in the land. He sets up this magnificent city and fortification called Camelot, from where he rules over this uh, united Britain for perhaps 20 years. And during this time, uh, at one point, Arthur falls ill, the knights are then sent out to search for the Holy Grail, which is this magic cup that if you drink from it can cure all ills. Uh, they find that. Arthur gets better. Um, Arthur receives a sword called Excalibur, which incidentally is not the same one he pulls from the stone. It's a different one altogether. He receives it from a mysterious nymph-like creature called the Lady of the Lake. It has magical powers and it allows him to defeat all enemies. Eventually, Arthur's nephew, his treacherous nephew, Mordred, rebels against him. In a civil war, the two of them are killed. But as Arthur lies dying on the field of battle, he tells one of his knights to throw Excalibur into a nearby lake. And when he does this, the arm of this 
as I say, nymph-like creature, a sort of mermaid with legs, who lives in this lake. Her arm comes from the, the breaks the surface, grabs the weapon by the hilt, and takes it down into the depths of the lake. And then Arthur is sailed across to an island in the middle of this lake called Avalon, where he is buried. And there is the legend says that one day Arthur will rise from the dead or in another legend that his descendant will one day secure the throne of Britain and that in a nutshell is the story of Arthur as was written about in the Middle Ages that we all know today. Now, the legend of King Arthur generally now is relegated by modern historians to, to medieval folklore. Do you think that is because of all these supernatural elements that the Arthurian legend incorporates? Or do you think, or is there like another reason why it's more considered folklore? Well, there's two reasons. The first is what you rightly say. Arthur, there's so many magical elements added onto this tale in the Middle Ages, such as Arthur fighting dragons, rescuing damsels in distress, there's wizards, witches, and all this sort of thing. Um, and so obviously they would say that particular Arthur is a, a, a creation of fiction. The other reason is that some people would say, well, there were earlier tales about King Arthur that betray him, not in this, uh, in this kind of magical context, but as an historical warlord. So perhaps he would, the stories of him in the Middle Ages were based on a, a real king who, who genuinely existed. But archaeologists will point out that nothing so far has ever been found from the time that Arthur's said to have lived, which was around 500 AD, that bears his name. Um, if, if he was such a... It, well, let's actually scale that back before we go into that part. Um, and this has been 25 years in the making for you. What, what originally set you down this path of, of looking into and finding the truth about this legend? You know, I can't really remember. It's been so long. I, th I think it can take... When, originally, going back about 25 years, in fact, earlier than that, I used to edit a magazine called Strange Phenomena, which, um, I mean, I trained as a journalist at college, and I ended up working for this magazine that investigated all the weird and wonderful... Like a kind of British version of um, the National Enquirer, I suppose. Hmm. Um and I kind of lost interest in some of the sort of more fanciful things that I used to investigate, like uh, some of the over-the-top UFO reports, ghosts and things like that. Not that I'm saying they don't exist, but my interest turned more to historical mysteries, the main reason being that they were probably a damn sight easier to solve in other words, you could come up with some definite answer to some of these mysteries, like where was King Richard III buried, or what did Mary Queen of Scots really do to deserve to be executed, or was President Lincoln assassinated as part of a conspiracy? They were things that you could possibly find a definite answer to, but trying to find a definite answer to whether UFOs exist or whether ghosts exist was far more uh, nebulous so I found that King Arthur, of all the mysteries, was one that really appealed to me because it also had this element of magic involved in it too. In other words, what lay behind some of these legends that were told in the Middle Ages. And that's kind of what started me off. But I never realised it was going to take 25 years to solve it, else I'd have given up and gone home. <laughs> yeah, I think after a couple of years I might have given up, but I'm glad that you did it because it, it really seems like you put the jigsaw puzzle together and able to to extrapolate from a variety of resource, uh, sources and, and really come up with a really good pos possible answer. So let's let's get into that. Where did the search begin? How did you first try and pinpoint who the real Arthur was, if there was a real Arthur? Well, the first thing is that just to get some idea of, of, of the common terms for the periods of history, from about the year 1000 until, say, 1500, that period is generally known as the Middle Ages. From about 500 to 1000 is generally known as the Dark Ages. And most archaeologists will turn in their graves at me using such simple descriptions, but 
to give a rough idea, those are the periods we're talking about. Now, the Dark Ages, a period of 500 years from around 500 AD, is when Britain, that had been ruled by the Romans, is suddenly falling apart in a state of anarchy. The Roman Empire, that had been ruling Britain for centuries, collapsed in the 400s. And Britain was left without any kind of law and order. The, the, the Roman legions had left and the administration had left. Now, can you imagine what would happen to, them, to America if suddenly all the police and all the army suddenly just disappeared and the National Guard, it had gone? I mean, there would soon be gang warfare all over the place and goodness knows who'd be taking over every little tiny area or your survivalists and so forth. Well, something like that happened in Britain and the country by 500 AD had divided up into a number of separate feuding kingdoms. Law and order collapsed, society and civilization collapsed, and this was the beginning of the Dark Ages. And during this period, very few records were actually kept um, because of the anarchy that, you know, that encompassed the land. And then, around about 1000 AD, 500 years later, things started to pick up, people started to put together civilization again, and it was during the Middle Ages that these fanciful tales of Arthur were written. Now, they say that King Arthur ruled at the beginning of the Dark Ages, 500 AD. But during that period, and the period the first of these romantic tales, uh, collectively called the Arthurian romances that were written in the Middle Ages were composed, a number of references to King Arthur still survive in various documents that uh, still exist in, in museums and libraries. And one of these, a very fascinating document known as the History of the Britons, which was written by a monk called Nennius in the early 800s, it's still 300 years after the period Arthur is said to have lived, but it's over 300 years before the first of these Arthurian romances were written in the Middle Ages. Nennius refers to Arthur as a down-to-earth warlord. He talks about him in a historical context. He doesn't bring in flights of fancy, such as uh, all the fighting of dragons and the mysterious witches and all the rest of it. He simply says that Arthur was a leader of the Britons, he united the various British kingdoms in a fight against the invading Anglo-Saxons. Now the Anglo-Saxons were from northern Germany and they began to invade Britain in the early Dark Ages because of the turmoil state that Britain was in. Eventually they conquered all of what's now England, which was named after them, Angleland. So that's why we still think of ourselves as Anglo-Saxons pushing the native Britons, the Celts, into what is now Wales in the west of Britain. Now, Arthur is said by Nennius to be the last British leader to successfully make a stand against the Anglo-Saxons and almost push them back into the sea. And he refers to a various number of battles he fought, and he tells us that he was an historical down-to-earth figure, and he gives the period that he lived in the, that he was king in the 490s to somewhere around about 520. And, and he's a down to earth historical figure. And when you read Nennius, plus a few other uh, scanty references to Arthur that were written during the dark ages, he's, they, the, the writers clearly considered him to be a real historical character. And it was this Arthur that I intended to try and find out, well, who he was. If there were no actual manuscripts or documents from the time that King Arthur, the real one, was supposed to live, then, and the earliest document that we have, I believe you said, is 300 years after he supposedly lived by the by Nennius, called um, the History of the Britons, how did Nennius get this information? Where did he base his information on? What sources? Well, he that actually really tells was. us at the beginning of his book, he knows that a lot of the British records were being lost in this ter turmoil period. Um, there's a number of reasons. One, obviously, there are pillaging Anglo-Saxons who are setting light to any place that's got books. 
Um, another reason is that those books that were written and not kept in good dry conditions in proper buildings like what the Romans had would very quickly rot away in the damp British climate. But the main reason is something that a lot of people don't think about. The people of the Dark Ages had very little to write on. Now, the Romans made paper and they made them in workshops in the Roman towns. These no longer existed. To actually make paper is quite a complicated procedure, especially paper that's going to last for any period of time. So most people, except for a few monks and a few monasteries in isolated locations, didn't have anything to write on, yet alone ink to write with. So that is why very few of these documents have survived. But a few did, and we can gain something about what happened during the period Arthur existed through these. But the main way of discovering who Arthur was comes from the latest developments of archaeology, and that's digging in the ground and seeing what we find there. And so my first step to try and work out, okay, these guys, um, like you asked about Nennius, where he got his information, he actually tells us at the beginning of his book, he says, I have heaped together all I have found amongst the writings of our holy men. In other words, he'd gone round various monasteries throughout the country, grabbed the various historical records that still survive, and copied them into one book before they were lost. And that is where he seems to have got his information from. And some of his information is wrong. And he actually says at the beginning, I don't know what's right or what's wrong with this. Some of this may just be legend, but it's important that I preserve this for posterity. And that's how we know about Arthur, thanks to Nennius going around the country and intrepidly collecting all these ancient documents that were quickly rotting away. Fascinating. Thank God for Nennius, huh? Um, in, <laughs> in, his, in the research that you've done, you obviously, it seems like you found a real-life counterpart. What about, was there an, well, I guess you can't really talk about King Arthur without talking about the Knights of the Round Table. Were there true-life counterparts for them? The thing is about the idea of Arthur is we have to try and forget the Arthur we see in the Hollywood portrayals. Mm -hmm. Now, in the modern version of the Arthurian tale, he's dressed in magnificent shining plate armour. The knights fight with broadswords and lances, and they live in huge Gothic castles. Well, these were a product of the Middle Ages. Going back a few hundred years before that, at the time Arthur is said to have lived, those sort of things didn't exist. For us, um, the Roman Empire had just collapsed, so Arthur would have looked more like a Roman soldier than anything from the medieval period of knights in armour. They would have fought with shorter swords, and their fortifications would have been... Uh, so there would have been built. Uh, there would have been towns surrounded by embankments, and on top of which were wooden stockades. So they would have looked very much more primitive than the idea of the Arthur we have today. But the reason why the uh, the knights of the Round Table are depicted in the way they are, and they are depicted in living in Gothic style castles is because the writers of the Middle Ages had absolutely no idea what people looked like centuries before. It's only modern history and the research of modern historians over the last few hundred years that have really told us what Romans looked like and what their dwellings were like. And in fact, if you look at any painting of, say, uh, biblical scenes that were made in the Middle Ages, you see that the, uh, let's take the crucifixion of Jesus, you see paintings of the soldiers at the foot of the cross. They're not dressed as Roman soldiers, they're all dressed in armour and the way you'd expect them in the medieval period. They, because they had no idea of what they really looked like. And the same is true for the King Arthur uh, period. Now, okay, there were not knights of the round table in the sense, if there was this historical King Arthur, and in the period that they all say that the story is set, 500 AD, there would not have been 
guys in shining armor, but there would have been Celtic chieftains. And one of the things the Romans record about them is when they actually met for conferences, the warriors of the Britons would sit in a circle around a cauldron in which a collective brew was made and they'd all drink from it. And the reason they sat in a circle is so that no person could be seen to be head of the alliance of tribes. And I believe this is probably where the later romanticized notion of the Knights of the Round Table came. Is there a real life Guinevere? Yes and no. <laughs> um, the the earliest tales tell us that his wife was actually called Ganomara, which is some sort of Celtic cross it's kind of, Latin name. It kind of sounds uh, a little close to it, almost, in a sense. It's close, but there is also a separate Guinevere, or in, in the early Brythonic, which was the language spoken in Britain at the time, um, that there's a character called Gwenhafar, which means white lady. And it seems that this white lady was a goddess of the Celts, or shall we say, a kind of demigoddess. It, she's like one of these characters from Greek mythology, a hero like Hercules, who's half god, half human, so he does human things as well. Gwenhafar was a, a character that is a personified goddess who is also a, a kind of goddess of fertility and love that gets involved in all sorts of tales in old Celtic uh, mythology. And the Arthur story, as it went on, being told by word of mouth rather than written down during the Dark Ages, seems to have attracted to it a number of other figures, whether they're mythical heroes or gods, goddesses, that seem to get tied up with the story. And it's possible that the this Gwenevar as Guinevere, as she's talked of, as she's, as she's uh, her name becomes later, gets a kind of like sucked into the Arthur story. We don't, I mean, unfortunately, we don't know who the wives of, um, of many of these Dark Age kings were, because Sadly, people didn't think it was that important to, re to, to record the names of women. So, um, we don't know. She could have been called Guinevere. She could have been named. She could have been called Guinevere. She could have been named after the goddess. It's not impossible. But Ganomara is the name given to uh, his wife in the earliest stories. So it's a possibility. Is there any possibility or any truth about the super, uh, supernatural elements of the story? Well, one of them that I thought was the least likely when I started to look into it was the tale of Excalibur. I mean, the idea of this being given to Arthur by the Lady of the Lake, this kind of mermaidy type creature, and then thrown back to her. In fact, she is the one who's supposed to have made it. Um how you make a sword under the water I've got no idea but anyway <laughs> that's, that's the story um, and I thought well that, that's not going to be that will have been made up or kind of come from, I don't know it, that just wouldn't have happened in the story as I've mentioned before when Arthur lies dying one of his knights has to throw the sword to the lady of the lake her arm comes out grabs it then Arthur's sailed across that lake to the Isle of Avalon which seems to be an island in the middle of this lake well, what's fascinating is that Roman writers record that Celts of the period that Arthur lived had this tradition that during a funeral, part of the funerary rite was for the king's sword to be cast into a sacred pool or lake as an offering to a water goddess to assure them safe passage to the underworld. And when the sword was thrown, then the body was sailed across to an island in the middle of the lake and they were buried. Well, it seemed that could be where the original story originated. In reality, somebody throws the sword of the king into a lake, which is believed to have been given to a water goddess of some kind, which then becomes the lady of the lake in the actual Arthurian story. But what made me totally convinced that one had derived from the other is that this lady, this 
water goddess of the Celts was known as Viviana. And the name given to the Lady of the Lake in the Arthurian stories is Vivian. It has to be based one upon the other. So you've got something like that, which, uh, okay, it may not be as magical as the story in the Middle Ages, but it's fascinating stuff. And we know for a fact that the Celts, it wasn't just a few Roman writers that tell us this, we know for a fact that these items were thrown into sacred pools because some of them that have dried up over the years have been excavated by archaeologists where they found many you know, important objects that have been thrown into these lakes and are now in the dried up mud at the bottom. Um, and many of these were swords of high-ranking individuals. Well, let's come back to the sword, uh, as particularly Excalibur, in, in a few moments, um, just because I want to save that part uh, for a little bit later. Uh, was there? What about the sword in the stone aspect of the Arthurian legend? Well, most people tend to think of that being the same as Excalibur, but in all the medieval tales, it's not the same. It's the complete. The idea that they were one and the same is more of a kind of Victorian idea. Um, originally the sword in the stone what happens is that according to the very earliest story of it that was written in the uh, 12th century uh, the, 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 that survives anyway and the person who, who wrote this uh, a man by the name of Robert de Baron who was a poet he claimed to have taken this from a much earlier uh, dark age account he says that um, the sword appears in a stone in St. Paul's Cathedral churchyard in the middle of London. Not out in the countryside. I mean, most of the modern Hollywood portrayals have Arthur pulling this sword out of a stone in the middle of the countryside. No, it's smack bang in the middle of of London in the churchyard. But what's more interesting is it's not stuck directly into the stone, but in an anvil on top of the stone. Now, quite why this should be, who knows? There's a possibility that the story could have come about because of a mistranslation. The old, um, the Latin word for a large chunk of stone is saxum, which is very similar word to Saxon. And anvil is a similar word to angle. It could have been that somebody at some point had said, in passing it on by word of mouth, that Arthur took the sword, i.e. the fight, from the Angles and Saxons. And somebody thought, he took a sword from an anvil and a Saxon, a piece of stone. And that could be how the story originated. But I like to think that there really was a stone that became associated with the story because in the churchyard of St. Paul's Cathedral, there stood a stone that was believed to be this stone that Arthur pulled the sword from, which had to be moved um, during the Great Fire of London in 1666. It was moved nearby. It eventually ended up being stuck in a hole in a wall of a building with a, a grating over it opposite a station called Cannon Street Station, um, a few hundred yards from St. Paul's Cathedral, and you couldn't see it. But really, really weirdly, that stone, which is actually known locally as the London Stone, um, is associated with a sword of power because the, the mayors of London, going right back almost a thousand years, had to tap their sword against this stone as part of their inauguration ceremony to prove their right to rule the city of London and before that the Roman governor of Britain had to take a stone a sword from this stone uh, as part of his um, investiture and so this stone still survives it's a block of limestone about two feet square in all directions and It was a part of a much bigger stone, but it's been stuck in this wall for years. And now, just as my book's coming out, they've announced that they're gonna knock down this building. (laughs) The stone's gonna be taken out, put in a nearby museum for a few weeks until the new building is erected and then put back there. So for the first time in like forever, the stone will be on public display in this museum while my book's being published, (laughs) which is, like, weird. 
Uh, almost uh, almost serendipitous in a sense. Almost magical. I'm trying. I'm trying to get a. <laughs> trying to get a. But the, the idea is they put it back in a, on a plinth in this new building they're doing. Um, but I'm trying to get a campaign going to have it put back in St Paul's Cathedral where it originally stood. It seems like the more appropriate place. Have they done any testing on the stone and the sword that, or you know, the object that's there? Yeah, they believe that it actually dates from Roman times, and it was uh, a block of limestone carved out by the Romans, possibly sixteen or seventeen hundred years ago. So it would certainly have been there during the period of the historical Arthur, which incidentally seems to suggest that King Arthur himself, because in the story of King Arthur pulling the sword from the stone, it's very close to where he lives as a boy. He's out strolling out one day, you know, a few out, a few minutes ride from where he actually lives where he sees this sword and pulls it out. So it suggests that whenever he ended up, he came originally from London. So I'm kind of like starting this bit of a campaign that was Arthur a Londoner. Ooh, well, well, that'll definitely capture uh, capture the attention of, of your fellow Englanders, to say the least. Uh, I'll, I'll definitely keep our ears out for that. I, I can't wait to see what happens with, with that. I'd love to love to actually be able to see it. Are there any pictures online uh, of, uh, of the object in stone? Yeah, if you got that, well, they're in my book, the uh, the lost tomb of King Arthur. There's pictures of it. But if you want to see them straight away, if you go to my website, which is grahamphillips.net, that's grahamphillips.net, um, on the first page, if you can click. There's a thing there saying, and one of the links is, was King Arthur a Londoner? You can click on that, and you'll see the whole little story about it, plus pictures. There, you know, there's so much information on your website. I was going through it, and for some reason, I must have skipped right over that part because I only put it up today. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, there you go. That because explains. I'm starting this. I'm starting this whole London Stone kind of campaign next week. See, so we've just had a new mayor of London elected, mm. and so everybody's interested in the law in, in the in the mayor of London. So I thought, what a you know, because the mayors of London used to have to tap their swords on this stone I thought it's a pretty good time now to, to, to start the campaign going but I haven't done it this week because everybody's so interested in hearing what this new mayor has to say by next week they'll be fed up with what he's got to say <laughs> and I can say something more interesting about it I hate that the truth um, right, let's, let's, uh, we've actually hit our uh, commercial break when we come back, historical investigator Graham Phillips reveals the true history of the legendary King Arthur, and you'll find out where the real final resting place is on the other side of this break, back in a mind's eye moment. Uh, we're back with author Graham Phillips. Graham, uh, before we get right back into the legend and, and, and the real history behind it, I gotta, excuse me, I gotta ask you, you ever doubt yourself? <laughs> I think... Do you ever say to yourself, what, what if my sources are wrong? The problem is, you see, everybody thinks that, I mean, I've written, I don't know, about 15 books or something. Everybody thinks that each time I research something, I come up with an answer and enough information to write a book. Now, that isn't true. The fact is, I may have actually had, over the 30 odd years I've been writing books, 15 books published, which is a book every couple of years. But in the meantime, I have researched so many other things that turned out to be dead ends. So I've there's loads and loads of half-finished books I've got. Well, I haven't actually written the book, but half-finished research where I find out, no, that character didn't exist. It's no good me. I mean, if I found out that Arthur didn't exist, what would be the point of writing a book about it? <laughs> you know what I mean? If it, so there's a lot of uh, stuff that I've done over the years that never got published um, and it's uh, it can be pretty frustrating doubting myself no because luckily enough every couple of years I do f come to some conclusion where I can write a book but getting absolutely frustrated and furious with myself yes hmm. now we talked about in the first half the the real life counterparts of King Arthur the possibility of a, a Guinevere the the Knights of the Round Table what about Camelot? Talk about the the real Camelot, if there was one. Well, yeah, this this is this is when it gets really exciting because I may have worked out that Arthur perhaps originated in London, 
but he certainly would not have set up his base of operations in London. Now, according to the legend, King Arthur ruled from this magnificent city called Camelot. And some people might say, well, if you're looking for Camelot, just look at a map and find a place called Camelot. Well, there isn't any place still called <laughs> that. Only. And there probably never was, because the word Camelot was an invention of a 12th century poet by the name of Chrétien de Troyes, and he had to think of a word to rhyme with Lancelot. And that's where Camelot comes from. It's like the Monty Python team saying, you know, Spamalot, or she makes me push the Pramalot. It's a difficult word to rhyme with Lancelot. <laughs> so Cam Camelot seems to have been made up. Now, before Chrétien was writing, other people did mention that Arthur ruled from this magnificent, impregnable city, but they don't give it a name, which tends to suggest that during the Dark Ages, as the story of Arthur is passed on from from mouth to mouth, that his uh, the name of this city was was forgotten. So we start off. We don't know what it's called, but we do know it's supposed to be the most. Uh, impressive city in the country around 500 AD so from the archaeological point of view where would that be now luckily enough in the last 20 years or so there's been advances in archaeology that has allowed us to, to work these things out now the four most important cities in Britain at the end of the Roman Empire were London, Lincoln, York and a place called Viriconium now, London, Lincoln and York are all on the east coast of Britain or on the east side of Britain, and they were very quickly taken over by the Anglo-Saxons. So if Arthur had been brought up in London when he was a young man, he soon had to move westwards because the Anglo-Saxons had overtaken London. Now, this left the capital of Britain as a city called Viriconium. Now, unlike the cities of London, for example, where the Roman remains lie beneath streets, extruded office blocks and apartment buildings. The ruins of Viriconium, some of its walls and foundations, are still visible in open countryside, smack bang in the middle of England, about four miles east of a town called Shrewsbury. And the ruins are, are open to the public. You can go around them now. And on the site, there's a small museum displaying the various discoveries that have been made there. And the, because it stands in open countryside, it's allowed archaeologists an unprecedented chance to do archaeological excavations. And what they found out is when many other cities in Britain were being abandoned for more easily defendable hilltop fortifications, Viriconium was still being occupied. Not more than that, around 500 AD, at exactly the time Arthur is said to have lived, this city of Viriconium was massively refortified and at the heart of the city, a huge winged mansion was built, which appears to have been the palace of an extremely important post-Roman warlord. And even the archaeologists say that whoever it was that seems to have united the Britons around the year 500 AD to push the Anglo-Saxons back for a while, which archaeology knows happened, that person must have ruled from here. So you've got the most powerful city in the country, seemingly the residence of somebody extremely important who's uniting the Britons, at exactly the time that Arthur is said to have been doing just that. So from the archaeological perspective, Viriconium seems to be the best candidate for an historical Camelot. We keep using the name Arthur. Was Arthur his... Well, you used a different name earlier. Where did the name Arthur come from? Ah, uh, now, oh, oh, this this is where I almost gave up. I've been spending years doing this research, and this is where a point... This is where I got to the point where I, I doubted myself. <laughs> and I doubted right. myself so much, I almost at my own head, <laughs> if, <laughs> if such a thing is possible. I was really, really frustrated because 
the name of the person who ruled from Viriconia around 500 AD is recorded in the in a manuscript that survives in the British Library in London. They, it's a, a series of dark age genealogies, in other words, family trees of the rulers of various parts of Britain. And it tells us who ruled from Viriconium at the, around 500. And it says his name was Owen Fan Gwyn. Now, when I first saw this, I thought, oh no, so it wasn't Arthur after all. I mean, from the archeological perspective, it seemed almost certain that whoever ruled from there was the person who was, who was uniting the Britons at the time of Arthur. So if you like, the Arthurian story could have evolved from him, but he was never called Arthur. And that would have been the end of my research. I mean, that's, you know, that there's no book there. There's no anything there. I mean, he wasn't called Arthur. But thank goodness, when I looked into the writings of a monk called Gildas, who lived within living memory of Arthur's time, he wrote in about the year 545, he lived, I mean, he himself as a young man, certainly his other people that were alive at the time would have known the period of Arthur had he existed. He refers to Owen Van Gwyn, but he also calls him by his title or battle name now it was a um it was a, a tradition at the time amongst the celts for warriors to be given battle names of animals um in some way representing their prowess in battle um it was somewhat similar to the native americans being called crazy horse or sitting bull the various kings of Britain were given names like the fox if they were cunning or the eagle if they were far-sighted. This man Owen Thangwin is referred to by Gildas who wrote in Latin as Ursus and Ursus is Latin for the bear. Now when you translate bear back into Brythonic, the language spoken in Britain at the time, the name for a bear is Arth. A-R-T-H and in fact it is still preserved in modern Welsh which is derived from Brythonic so Arth very often these dark age warlords because the ruling classes or the, 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 the those that could write like the monks tended to write and speak in Latin and others spoke in Brythonic would tend to use both names Latin and Brythonic for the names of these animals and so the Arth and Ursus could easily have put together. So you've got Arthursus, which could have been shortened to Arthur in just the same way as uh, Antonius is shortened to Antony or Marcus to Mark. So, but even leaving that aside, we've got the following things. We've got the most powerful city in the country at the time that Arthur is said to have ruled the most powerful city in the country is ruled by a man called Arth. <laughs> it seemed to me that King Arthur had gone down in history under his title. And it wouldn't be the first time that such a thing has happened. You may have heard of Genghis Khan, the great Mongol warrior who conquered half the world. That wasn't his real name. That was his title, meaning universal ruler. His real name was Temujin. Yeah. And I think that Arthur is somebody who went down in history under his title, which is why the historians and archaeologists have found nothing bearing his name from that period of time. That's why, I mean, your work is so good, because you were able to extrapolate from so many different sources and then connect them and, and able to put the, the pieces together and get a, a view of, of, of really what, what, what could be. And you really have some tangible information there and for me at least when when i was reading it this is the point where it was like ding 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 this 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 could definitely could be true so for you i mean i imagine for you you went from one end of the spectrum to doubting yourself or at least being frustrated with what you were coming and encountering and then from here this one piece of evidence kind of turns it to the opposite and almost proves it in a sense well yeah the final proof that i got for the fact that this man owen than Gwyn, who's born that name became arth arthur the bear that the figure that was behind the legend of king arthur was that in the 
medieval Arthurian romances, Arthur's father is called Uther Pendragon. Now, the historical Owen Than Gwyn's father is recorded in these genealogies, these family trees, with an, a, another battle name, a title, The Terrible Head Dragon. Translate that back into Brythonic, and it's Uther Pendragon. Hmm. His father was called... So you've got a man called Arthur, whose father's called Uther Pendragon, who rules from the most powerful city in the country at the time. Arthur is said to have ruled the most powerful city, and his father was called Uther Pendragon. It surely is the same person. So I don't have to eat my own head. It's just too hard to ignore. And, and to prove all this, you really pretty much need a body. And you had to put your money where your mouth is. And you had to take this from a literal journey to a, an actual archaeological expedition did i'm wondering did the money come out of your pocket how, how did you fund this because i imagine it would have it must have cost some money the archaeology luckily enough was already done i mean the archaeologists wanted to find out what had happened in this one of these last roman cities that was still being occupied and many decades after the romans left so the archaeologists uh, from the university of birmingham big university in the center of england funded that but it was another ex, uh, archaeological ex, uh, 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 survey that I managed to get going on my own. And that was when I decided to try and find out where Arthur was buried. Um, what, 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 knowing that the person who was behind the Arthur legend was this Owen Van Gwyn, I was able to find in the uh, University of Oxford, the library at Oxford University, I managed to find a, a poem, an ancient war poem that, that was written in the Dark Ages around 650 AD, which talks about where all the kings that ruled from Viriconium were buried. And it talks about the first of them, Owen Than Gwyn, being buried on an island in the middle of a lake at a place called Bass Church. But well, in fact, the word it used was the Churches of Bassa. Now, just a few miles north of Viriconium, there's a village today called Bass Church, which has to be the same as this old poem's reference to the Churches of Bassa. And once I uh, went there, I found that just outside the modern village of Bass Church, there is what was once a lake with a hill in the middle of it, uh, but a lot of that lake has now dried up because it has been drained for farmland. But some parts of the lake, some parts, you know, bits of the water still survive. But the hillock in the middle that was once an island still survives. And the, the limited amount of archaeology that had gone on there has shown that it was that it had a series of ringed um, embankments around it. But it wasn't used as a fortification. It seems to have been some sort of ceremonial site in use around about the year 500 AD. And this seems to have been the site where the kings from Viriconium were buried. Now, when referring to Owen Than Gwyn, it talks about a specific acre of land. Um, and it's fairly obvious when you, go, when you look at the topography of the area, where that late acre of land is, there's an area called the enclosure today, which is like an acre field surrounded by another ringed embankment. So I thought that has got to be where Owen is buried. And if Owen is Arthur, that's Arthur's burial site. And so unfortunately we can't just dig. And first you've got to find out where to dig in this acre of land. Uh, you can't just dig aids on private land, but mainly it's protected. It's a protected monument, and the government department called English Heritage has to give permission for uh, sites of archaeological interest to be excavated. But I was able to organise a, a, a geophysics scan of the area. I've got a television company, but I've actually got, I've got National Geographic involved who put the money up to do this whole thing. And they got a series, a number of archaeologists with the latest um, geophysics equipment. Now, what geophysics equipment is, is scientific technological um, uh, d devices which can 
peer down under the ground, see what's in the soil without the need to dig, such as, for example, ground penetrating radar, which produces a computer generated image of what is in the soil. And they spent all day surveying this area with various types of geo, uh, geophysics equipment. And the only anomaly, the only thing that was down there under the ground in this acre of land, right in the middle, was a circular pit about, or what had been a pit and then filled in at some time later, that's what the equipment could tell, a circular pit about six feet across, six feet deep, consistent with the circular type of burial ditches that were dug 1500 years ago. But what was most remarkable is right in the middle of this pit, there was an iron object, perhaps a, a few inches across, which the archaeologists believe was the boss, the central part of an ancient shield. And what's fascinating about that is the tradition of which our warriors were buried back at the time Arthur is said to have lived, was they were put in a pit on their side with their shield on their arm. So it really seems that in exactly the place that I said that the historical Arthur was buried, there was somebody, a high status individual, buried around the time that Arthur is said to have lived. So I'm pretty sure that I've got good evidence that this is the tomb of King Arthur. All I need now is to get permission from English Heritage to dig it up. What's the word on the permission? It's a bit of a problem. There's a lot of red tape, as of you course. can probably imagine. <laughs> there always is. The problem is, I mean, it's, English Heritage have said no for the moment. Now, I'm, I, I don't see any conspiracy in this. I mean, the archaeologists behind it, they want to dig, because even if they don't believe my King Arthur story, they do say, well, there's an important dark age king perhaps buried here we'd like to dig so and and, and we've got the geophysics people we've, we've got everybody on site we can probably get permission from the farmer to dig up as long as we pay him um he, he's got no real problem with it i don't think uh it would certainly stop people going across his land and leaving his his gates open so all his cows get out once the thing was removed so I think we could probably get permission from the owner but the big problem is that we have um, English heritage don't tend to allow for an archaeological dig unless it's absolutely essential the reason being that as years go by archaeological geophysics becomes so much more advanced that in a few years we may be able to see what lies under the ground completely, bones and all, hmm. without the need to dig. And once you dig, you destroy a site. So they're very reluctant to allow a dig to take place. But because I've now published all this, and everyone knows exactly where it is, they're going to have to allow a dig. Otherwise, some unscrupulous, unqualified individuals mm -hmm. with metal detectors are going to go and dig it up. And, and that is the, the, the sad truth, but, uh, you know, obviously we'd rather have it in a, in a professional, uh, professionally done as opposed to, you know, some schlub off the street uh, just doing it just to probably get some fame really more than anything. Uh, let's let's do this the proper way. Um, do you, what would you say percentage wise? Do you have you have you got any like a uh, word on where they're leaning toward now now that the book is out? I'm finding out next week. Right. I haven't started approaching them yet until my book's been published in the, the States and it's been out in America for a few weeks now. It only gets published in Britain next week, which ah. is why I'm starting all this publicity in London. So what I'm going to do next week is to approach English Heritage and say, look, I, I can't not tell people where this tomb actually is hmm. uh, I, I mean I've got to write this enough people have, re have known about my research over the years anyway it's astonishing no one's dug it up yet and really if you don't give permission for even if you don't believe in King Arthur for the tomb of a dark age warlord to be excavated then it's going to be destroyed and then we'll never know really who that person was whether it was Arthur, whether it was somebody else, and what kind of position that person held in local society. And 
basically, I think they're going to have to say yes, because they do say yes when, if there's suddenly going to be a new road put through or a new building built, they give permission and a dig takes take place before the whole thing is destroyed. So I'm pretty certain, 90%, that they'll grant permission pretty soon. All right, I'll keep my fingers crossed for you. Um, <laughs> any, any from the locals that are around there, any accounts about uh, a sword being found in that area, uh, pos- the possibility of the, of the real Excalibur? Well, it, interestingly, we've tried to look for it. The story is that the Excalibur was thrown into the lake and then Arthur is sailed across it to be buried. Now, if he is buried on this island, which could be the real Avalon, once again, this island isn't called Avalon, um, it's actually known as the birth, which means beautiful. But, you know, Avalon could be a name that gradually got attached to it because of a mystical land in Celtic mythology called Avalon. But it could be the real Avalon, I suppose, you know, as far as the place where Arthur is supposed to be buried. And it does seem quite fitting that the historical Arthur is buried on a what was an island. But it was once surrounded completely by water. But some of these, uh, some, a few lakes of this original large lake still survive. And when I was doing this uh, archaeological stuff with um, the National Geographic, they said, how about trying to find, to see if Excalibur is in one of these lakes that still survives? I basically said, well, the chances are it might be under the actual, you know, in the earth of a dried up part of the lake, you know. So why not do a geophysics scan of that? And they said, well, that at the moment is just too expensive. It's just too large an area. But it would be interesting and it would make good TV to have a lake excavated. So I said, fine. So one of the pretty large lakes, and there's a chance that that was the area where the sword was thrown, they got a, um, they organised a... Uh, a marine archaeological survey of this lake and got a, um, an, 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 a boat that went up and down the lake with scanning equipment that could look to see what was buried in the silt at the bottom of the lake and found that there seemed to be some sort of object at the centre of the lake that matched what a sword could look like and it could survive hmm. all these centuries in the mud at the bottom of the lake it wouldn't oxidize you tend to think that wetness is what makes things go rusty it isn't it's the oxygen so in a sort in the mud under a lake it could survive so they said right let's get the divers down there so a team of divers went down and when they came up they said look it's just the water is too peat stained it's just you know you can't see more than a couple of feet in front of your face And what makes things worse is there's about four feet of muddy silt on the bottom of the lake before you actually get the solid bed. So with the equipment we have at the moment, we can't dig up and see if that is a sword. But one would say, well, how would you know it was Arthur's sword? Well, the interesting thing is that the oldest description of Excalibur does tell us that it had a golden hilt with two intertwined serpents on it. And I actually got a expert on dark age weapons to recreate a sword that would have been from the right historical period, a late Roman sword called the Spartha, which is about two and a half feet long, um, with the Roman style double twisted serpent on a golden hilt. Um, And if you go on my website, on the top of every page, my uh, menu to go to the different parts of my website is that actual, it's a photograph of that actual sword we had made uh, as a replica. So in other words, the reason I explain that, if we find a sword that looks like that, we're pretty sure that it is Excalibur. Yeah. You left no stone unturned, and pun intended on that one, sir. Uh, <laughs> um, and there's actually there's there's still more left to the story which we haven't talked about. You found some real tangible evidence, but I'm not gonna I'm not gonna ask you to go into it because I we don't want to give everything away. You've been so graceful, and we and we're grateful that you gave away so much information of the book. But we don't want to give away exactly everything right now. Um, is there? In, 
reading the book and and now listening to you, to me, I, I envision I could definitely see a documentary or, or some type of miniseries. Any plans in, in that respect? There has been a documentary that has just. I, I remember I said that uh, National Geographic. Right. Exactly. That should be shown in the states soon. Um, there's another one that's actually this very week. Is it this week? About the nineteenth, anyway, of this month on the Discovery Channel. There is a show called Forbidden History, and one of the episodes is all about me <laughs> searching for, basically talking about and going around all the sites I've just spoken about, and that's on the Discovery Channel. It's called Forbidden History, and it's the episode uh, something 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 about King Arthur um, and that's on in the States for the first time I think it's the 19th of this month Graham really great job I mean it really seems like all the pieces were there just someone had to, to find them and put the, the pieces together and, and to me in my opinion it really looks like you did Graham fantastic research really provocative stuff I mean to me after after reading it and, and talking with you it really makes you think about what other supposed myths and, and legends have true counterparts well, absolutely. I, I, I think I'm running out of people to do. I've done Robin Hood, and I've, <laughs> I've done King Arthur, and I've done Alexander the Great. I don't know. Maybe I'll look for the blue helmet of Thom. <laughs> like, no one's ever heard of that. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think you just made it up. So that's what. Uh... I actually did just make the blue helmet of Thom. Well, well, what's but, that one about? I don't know. I was thinking of looking for Thor's helmet. <laughs> Well, that works too. That that'll be a great read itself. Share before I let you go. Share your social media information one last time. Yeah, my website is grahamphillips.net, not .com. That's like imagine me with a net over my head. That's how you won't forget it. <laughs> grahamphillips.net. Uh, on the front page, there's uh, you can click. You, there's pictures of all my books. You can click on any of them and get a good few pages of information plus loads of pictures. The book is called. Uh, the Lost Tomb of King Arthur, and uh, well, it, it's in the USA. It's already available on Amazon and uh, in, as they say, all good bookstores. And in Britain, it should be out in about a week. Graham Phillips, Lost Tomb of King Arthur. Thanks so much for giving us a piece of your time tonight. Thank you very much. We'll be right back for the Mind's Eye Show wrap up. All right, we're back. We did spoil you a little bit this week. Three episodes in one week? You gotta be kidding me. Well, guess what? We're backing it up with two more next week. Join us on Monday and Tuesday as we commemorate the 20th anniversary of Bradley Knowles' passing. Frontman of multi-platinum, ska, punk, reggae, band, sublime, Bradley left behind a, a rich musical legacy when he died. On Monday, lifelong friend and star of the infamous date rape video, Todd Zalkins will reveal never-heard-before stories. We'll follow that up on Tuesday with Heidi Sigmund Kuda, author of Bradley's biography, Crazy Fool, and Emmy Award-winning producer. We'll paint a portrait of the late musician who became the voice of the extreme generation. More info about these two guests and future shows up on our website, themindseyemedia.com, themindseyemedia.com. As always, big thank you to you, the listener. Until the next one, I'm your host, Brian Turnoff, and this is The Mind's Eye.